kilometers. Um, so um, I think to talk about that, uh, we have uh, Matthias Roslin from EMPA and then Bryant Nelson from NIST, uh, and they will present on the uh, cooperation and standardization of analytical methods. Thank you, Anil. So um, my name is Bryant Nelson. I'm here representing uh, NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and also ASTM, uh, American Society for Testing and Materials. And um, Matthias and I are going to talk about some of the issues th that are important uh, when you're trying to standardize um, uh, analytical methods for uh, testing nanomaterials. And um, we could talk for about eight hours on this topic, but we're going to keep it to 20 minutes. Uh, it's such a broad area of, uh, of concern that um, when, when Baird invited me to come to this conference uh, a little less than three weeks ago, um, my uh, materials went straight to the director and I'm here. It usually takes uh, two or three months for anyone from NIST to, to travel. So uh, nanotechnology, nanomedicine is very, very critical uh, to the U.S. economy and um, I'll, I'll tell you how, a little bit about how standards are important uh, underpinning this effort. So. Um, we are a non-regulatory agency of the Department of Commerce, but we closely collaborate with um, regulators like the FDA and the EPA, um, both in, in all areas of nanotechnology, but specifically in nanomedicine and nanosafety. Um, I've come from the Gaithersburg campus, which is our main campus, where we have um, all of our biologists and analytical chemists both Matthias and I are, are analytical chemists, and uh, where we do most of our work on standards development and in those areas. Okay, so um, what is a standard exactly? Well, there are many different definitions of a, of a, of a standard. Uh, everyone has their own viewpoint on what makes a standard, but we can all agree on that um, um, when we develop a method, that is um, based upon a standard or that produces a standard, that's a good thing. So standards can be um, physical objects that you can hold in your hand uh, that have um, values traceable to the SI. These are called reference materials. Standards can be uh, documentary um, uh, written documents that are consensus-based, and they can also be uh, guides and, and, uh, and practices. But nanotechnology standardization actually began right after um, the NNI was formed uh, back in 2000. About four, four years later, um, this area was deemed so important that uh, other NIST and other, other agencies got involved in trying to define uh, terms for standardization for nanomaterials and also um, uh, defining what types of um, uh, methodologies are, are important. So standardization ranges from different levels. Okay, there's um, uh, developers at the international levels, uh, developers at the regional levels, and also standard development organizations at the national levels. And um, each one of these organizations requires uh, international participation. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about ASTM, um, because that's what I, the agency, uh, the, the group that I represent. But um, I encourage you to um, get involved in any organization that is critical to making uh, uh, consensus standards for nanomedicine, because your voices are quite, quite important in this area. It requires extensive international participation. Now, why is this? Standards range throughout the economy so that they support uh, international trade, uh, technology, innovation. Most people don't uh, attribute standard development to um, uh, increasing innovation, but they actually do. Without standards, we, we cannot uh, push uh, our nanomedicine uh, uh, products to the very edge, uh, and we need this. We need standards in, 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 uh, in that area, and also competition across industries are also supported by standards. So, so the committee that I chair at ASTM is actually uh, E56, E56, which is focused on uh, standards for nano-enabled medical products. Uh, we currently have uh, 20 members. Um, 
even only after being established in 2017. And I just recruited uh, four new members today, so we now have 24 <laughs> new international partners. Um, but I, we have two main goals for uh, this committee. Uh, one is to develop science-based science standard test methods, standard practices, guides, and specifications, and performance standards for medical applications of nanotechnology, nanomedicine nanotechnology. So um, the second um, goal of our committee is to support the development and regulation of medical products by providing documentary consensus standards. So all of our standards that we produce are agreed upon by all of the stakeholders uh, involved in the standards making process. Okay. Uh, we have uh, approximately eight standards in, in, uh, under, under development, um, ranging from a standard test method for a quantitative measurement of the chemotractic capacity of a nanoparticulate material in vitro, all the way through um, a, a new proposed uh, test method for poly polyethylene glyco quantitation on nanoparticles um, using HPLC with evaporative light scattering detection. So we have a wide variety of different types of standards that we're currently working on and many more coming in down the pipeline. So the goal of all of the standardization, of course, is um, to be able to um, enhance um, inter international competitiveness and, and commerce, specifically in the U.S., but also all, all globally. So uh, how do we get to high-quality cell-based assays for nano-enabled medical products? Well, most people start with an SOP, which is what the U EU and the U.S. are working on currently. But we, we want to get to the, the top key, the top level, which is a, a documentary consensus standard. But it requires a lot of hard work to get there. You can't just start in an SOP and expect to convert it into a documentary standard. You have to go through uh, a, a whole slew of measurement metrology issues that will require um, further in-depth expense, time, and also labor. And these areas are uh, all under the umbrella of a measurement and assurance. Let's see if I can show you. So right here. This requires um, stakeholders who are interested in getting to these high-level uh, documentary test methods to, to, under, to take their methods and SOPs through interlaboratory comparisons, um, to really define and design well-thought-out experiments to test all the factors involved into uh, testing their nanomedicines, um, development of an inclusion of the correct process controls, and also documentating, documentating all of your uh, experimental procedures. So uh, industry really, um, I would recommend that they concentrate on this area more so than trying to get to a documentary standard um, rapidly, because they want a high quality uh, standard that will trans uh, translate globally. So it's going to take a, a lot of time, and, but it, the high quality will support manufacturing and regulation in the end. So what, are, what about this, uh, this measurement assurance? Well, I like to call it a, um, or describe it in terms of a uh, three-legged stool, where there are components of measurement assurance that uh, if you don't do all three, your stool won't stand. And the, what I'm talking about are traceability, measurement uncertainty, and method validation. In the interest of time, I'm just going to concentrate on traceability right now. Um, and Matthias will talk about the other two. Um, but in order to have confidence and comparability or reproducible results across time and space, you need all three of these attributes of measurement assurance. So traceability, what does this mean? Well, it refers to assay results. does not refer to uh, analysis conditions or instrumentation. It strictly refers to assay results. And what I mean by that is that you need to have um, uh, your measurement results traceable to an international standard. So if I'm, if I'm in a lab and I do a measurement, I need to guarantee that all of my measurements from my lab going to can be traced from a 
uh, a local calibration lab, through a primary standards lab, and then maybe through NEST, or, uh, depending on wh what country you're in, back to an SI unit in Paris, okay? That's traceability. Shown in this cartoon here, for example, if you are doing a measurement with a pipette and you want to make sure that your whatever measurement, say your, your mass of, of liquid that you're delivering is very accurate, you, you have to be traceable through an unbroken chain of measurements all the way back to the SI. Okay? But there are certain key uh, parameters that really define uh, metrological traceability of a, of, a, of a measurement, a result. These are shown here. Well, the first one is that your, the, whatever you're measuring, your measurand has to be well-defined and the quantity that you're measuring has to be specific and defined also. The second one is that you, um, you need to fully describe your measurement system or tool that you're using and the working standard for the measurement has to be clearly described. Following that, uh, Matthias will talk a little bit about this, you have to have a, a good description of your measurement uncertainty involved in your measurement. And then you have to have the two separate quality programs pr um, set up, one that measures the, um, the accuracy of your measurement system, and the other one that measures the the, the working standard concentration or, uh, or, or level that has to be reproducible across time and space. And if you want to put the icing on the cake, then you really need to have uh, or certify that your scientists who are doing the measurement are, uh, are competent. Okay. But, you know, this situation gets very difficult when you're actually trying to do uh, traceability on a biological system, such as an in vitro cell assay. Um, the, the, um, the actual measurement or the measurand that you're trying to measure is defined by the measurement system. And so that gets a little bit tricky when you don't have a well-defined um, measurand. Uh, it would be nice to have a cell, a standard cell, where we can trace back all of the different uh, processes that go on with uh, nanomedicine interacting with the cell, but we currently don't have that. Um, but it's, uh, traceability in biological measurements requires some further um, clarification and description. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Matthias, and uh, he'll carry on from here. Yeah. Thank you, Matthias. Thanks, Brian. So, <laughs> so actually, I want to further elaborate a little bit more on the, about this traceability because here in this slide is a very important sentence which most likely not many of you will recognize and see why it's important. That, that one will show why we need documentary standard. So I talk slightly more about traceability and I want to show this one sentence in an example. And this example is a very simple cell assay. We use this, you know, between us, quite many, you know, which we did developments the last few years. This is simple assays, it's a few operation interaction, and even that one, if you write it down, this is now done just in a flow chart, if you write down it down sentence by sentence, that is meant. I'm measuring, my, I'm measuring is defined by the measurement, so often the property I'm measuring is defined by the measurement. This is how it's written down. And it's important that you start realizing if you once has written down your SOP, you use it as it has written down. And yes, it's nice in a scientific environment to say, okay, I want to make this and this changes, but then you start losing your traceability and you start losing your comparability. That's the main sense of a documentary standard. So I'm always astonished, you know, when I look at labs, they have the SOP stored someplace. They have never, never have the SOPs at their working desk. And this is the most standardized way to do something. These are pilots, and they, doing always the same, have checklists. And your, st your standard, your document is standard, is the same like these pilots and they have in their hand. It's a doc it's, they go through and it's documented. So. You your pilots use standardized procedure. They have checklists, so use them. 
And actually, there's a very nice example I found about a year ago. Even the astronauts on the moon had checklists. They were stored here on their jacket, and they had their checklist what to do. So this is no reason why, when you know Neil Armstrong used this checklist, why a student in a lab cannot use a standard or an SOP. There is no excuse for this. So a few more things, you know, what besides we need, and this is important when you develop and when you get the, the, the credibility of your documentary standard, is you have to go through a good method validation, and so you have to establish your scope. Important is that you get a clear measurement model and you demonstrate that you're really measuring what you're doing so it becomes fit for purpose and there is also comes the influence of your stakeholder because they want to measure what they want but they don't want an overkill. So one thing is something which we use and which I've seen also here at CleanArm, this is this cause and effect approach to really start to understand what your measurement model is, what all the effects are, so really can then go through and also put in you experimental design, the proper control, so you really can say at the end, yes, my assay worked, now I can think about you know, what it does mean in terms of biology. So this is what you do, you check your model, complete this and test your scope. And then at the end, you know, you also have to compare. So what you need, you have to establish, and that's in this field quite a difficult thing still to do, is to find out you know, how you compare. So you need measurement uncertainty, so the range where you have variability, so to understand are these results the same or not the same. So coming back, you know, this is what we have to do in terms of developing these standards is you know, sort out the bits to get reproducible, to you know, get the understand and develop a range where the results can't really lie and where it's unbiased and now, only now, I can start making decisions. And that's it, the important thing because we want to know is it a product which is safe to be on the market or is it not? And we have to make decisions. So the thing is, if we have to do this, we have really to get reproducible results. And so, the only thing when results are useful if we can compare them. And this means either to observe a trend, to look at limits, or to do comparability over space and time. And for this one, especially in this field, have we seen with the traceability uh, you know, in bi for biological assay, this needs documentary standards. Otherwise, we are lost. We get many results, we get tons of publication, yes. It's nice for the academic world to have tons of publication and to fight, but it brings the whole field not forward because the measurements have been done slightly different and that's one of the reasons why they don't agree. So to come to the conclusion, we need really traceability, we need a proper method validation and understanding of our measurement, establish uncertainties, and we have to realize, especially in biological assays, that you know, this is defined what I'm measuring, so it's the documentary, and this is the reason, the main reason for having these documentary standards, and everybody is welcome to develop them. So, and this helps them to, to, you know, to develop evidence that things are really valid. And at the end, I have to say, you know, this measurement science, what we collaborate, especially also in the field of nanomedicine or nanotoxicology, metrology there, measurement science is still completely under development. We are not yet there. But it needs, and this is what I'm great, you know, I have witnessed the collaboration for more than 22 years, and I was in the group of Brian for, as a guest scientist, over more than five years, you know, doing really close collaboration and all these thoughts have been worked out in many, many meetings or drives to NIST discussion, and that's what we need, this collaborative spirit, not just in one country, but all across, and to be open-minded and find the best solution. I think that's, for us, the conclusion Excellent. of this talk. Excellent. Thank you.
Well said. Excellent. Good job. Um, so I will open the floor for any questions or comments. Any questions on standards? <coughs> Robert. Patrick. Yeah, Robert. Yeah, you can speak. You can hear. Okay, I'll speak a little bit louder then. Because yeah. I don't think the mic is working. Yeah, yes, it now it's working. <laughs> Um, one word I was expecting to hear, and I may have missed it uh, if you spoke uh, relatively quickly, was the word reference material. Can oh, you comment on that? Yeah, yeah. I, we mentioned it. I mentioned it at the very beginning, ah. the type of standards that we have uh, yeah. available. Because also in, in the latest slide that, that Matthias was showing, I think for comparing of results and for validation uh, for, the, for the method, the reference materials are, are very important. So a, a sponsored question can be what kind of reference material are available? <laughs> <laughs> so we have all kinds of reference materials, but in particular yeah. related to nanotechnology, um, we have um, particle-based reference materials, uh, gold, silver, titanium dioxide, some types of carbon nanotubes, um, yeah. No organic right now. I wanted to ask right the question. Is um, one liposome a good reference material for another liposome? Would you use the same uh, reference material for Doxil and uh, Onivide? <laughs> no, the, the reference materials are fit for purpose. So reference materials are utilized for certain types of, of measurements. For example, calibrations of your instrumentation. Um, but if, when you're trying to... Um, evaluate the uh, effect of a particular liposome, one type of liposome reference material would, would never do the job. Uh, Patrick? May I ask Patrick. a question which is a bit similar? Is, let's say, an ASTM standard comparable to a uh, SEN standard or uh, an OECD standards? Or, because there is, you know, if I understand properly, there are different standard organizations over the world. So uh, is there a difference between these organizations? Or can you tell us a bit? Sure. Um, so some of these standard organizations are regional standard organizations, um, and some are, are, are national. And one of the main difference, how ASTM stands out from all the other types of organizations, standard organizations, is that we include, when we create these documentary standards, we include extensive testing of the assays. This is called an interlaboratory um, um, program, interlaboratory testing program. And uh, in that program, we look at, for the assays, uh, the types of, of, of precision and bias involved in the measurement. So both uh, repeatability, intra-assay, uh, interlaboratory uh, precision, and also interlaboratory reproducibility. I think there is also one important addition. You know, we should not see the standardization organization as competitors. We have to understand, actually, that they have, within the different organizations, agreements where they recognize each other's standards. Yes. Okay. Any agreements between ASTM and ISO? Yeah. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Hans? Oh, just a quick comment on reference standards. So you can buy reference standards for size quite easily. There's a lot of debate about a reference standard for concentration, which I understand this is having uh, nightmares about. And then thirdly, you really, we would like standards for charge, which are not available at all. So when you say the standards are there, they're only there for one property, which is size. And they're not really there for the other properties, which matter in this field. Actually, I give you a slight preview. Uh, I'm involved in a comparison directly with NIST. I came up with to them and said, I want to measure particle concentration. How well can we do this? This is on the way, and we learned tons of it with just with gold. And actually, at the moment, there is a huge European program on the way, which is under the lead of NIH, just with one, with one standard, to look at least for particle concentration. So this stays ways on the way, but we have learned some nasty experience in this way, mm -hmm. which I think is also for the field quite important. The, the other issue uh, regarding um, developing standards 
for other characteristics of nanoparticles uh, is stakeholder use. So our stakeholders uh, have come to us, mainly industry, and requested uh, the development of certain types of standards. Um, we have to weigh the uh, request for standards against the cost and the potential use. And um, as far as I understand right now, um, charge-based standards have not, the cost-benefit ratio for producing them is not adequate. It, because it, it requires a lot of funding. Even though I went through quickly that uh, the budget, I, I flashed quickly the budget for NIST. Um, last, this year, we have a budget of $1.2 billion for standards development and, so, uh, and other research. But the, the money that comes back in from the, uh, the sale of these standards doesn't support certain types of, uh, of efforts. And also, uh, concentration depends on the type of material. For example, the gold particles, if you do a concentration measurement, and then someone else is making a liposome or a polymer in the nanomedical products area, then you need a separate standard for that. So uh, th that's where the priority comes in from, um, you know, from this. And then so we developed a, a, a prioritized list of standards because NIST cannot produce 100 reference material standards in, in the next 100 years. I can challenge them in nano, but um, so uh, that's, that's the uh, one challenge. But I think certainly, the, at least on the European side, um, I got several questions about the particle number measurement standards. Yeah. There is none yeah. anywhere that we know of. There are many size measurement standards. They are, is it a potential they are these, they are especially one which comes, you know, from the British one, from the British side, from, the, uh, from their side, and they actually, this is a huge European program, and I was just part, one of the labs doing particle number concentration measurement, and to my understanding, it's 50 institutions who take part with about 80 different instruments, so they just, end of July, they had to have the results in, and I think end of the year, the whole thing will be published, but it took them more than a year to develop the material and to develop the, you know, the, all the description for the interlab comparison. That one will be a very interesting one. It's just with one material, we, in a very small one, uh, did it with different materials and with the different materials, even if it was gold, we had some very nasty surprises. Yep. Uh, Frank? Yeah. Uh, this is Frank Weichold again. The uh, opportunity to build an international framework, and not necessarily, particularly because of the resource requirements, uh, duplicating standards across the nations, uh, how far is this developed? I mean, practically, in some ways, we do it because we know, well, that the, the Brits have this standard and, and the others have. But it's kind of what we know about. Is there an official framework that we actually can build on? And it's my ignorance. I'm sorry, I'm not a standards person so much. Um, can it be done, number two? And number three, um, when I used to work in the lab, not for nanomaterial, but I often used uh, sometimes clinical product that is manufactured in a standardized way because the manufacturer has to maintain a certain range of standard in the medical product. As a, as, a, as a laboratory standard. Um, and to what extent is this entertained and permissible uh, in the context of uh, getting a handle on providing reasonable standards? Because it, again, is a burden on each and every lab to yeah. be creative and standardize internally, right. where that can be leveraged at least you know, for particularly difficult materials. Yeah. So. Um I, I don't want to, I'll put uh, Julia Meyer on the spot here. <laughs> so the standards, you know, we're talking about NIST and GRC, there are material standards. But then when you're talking about the medical products, uh, or European Pharmacopoeia, U.S. Pharmacopoeia, they develop standards. They develop reference material standards for drug products. So, Julia, are you doing anything in nanotechnology? Are you doing any? 
nano standards. That's why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we are at the very beginning, I would say. So because we start the work uh, when the markets are on the product, uh, when the products are on the market. So uh, we are currently working on a general method for dynamic light scattering. Um, this is uh, under harmonization uh, with the JP, Japanese Pharmacopeia, and the US Pharmacopeia. We also work on a European standard um, a monograph on iron sucrose concentra concentrated solution, and there will be also more projects coming. So um, I think we are also interested at a certain stage to um, look into this method and yeah, <coughs> consider if we could uh, collaborate and um, yeah. So, so do you talk to U.S. Pharmacopoeia? I mean, the, yeah. the question Frank is asking is, uh, are there, you know, communication between the organizations? I thought there is some kind of collaboration between, uh, at least discussions between uh, pharmacopoeias across. Yes, we do that. So we have the uh, Pharmacopoeia um, uh, discussion group, the PDG, and we meet uh, once a year. Um, we have numbers, uh, monthly teleconferences, and we discuss a uh, diverse topic, but nanomedicine is only one part of this, of course. So, um, but the first standard, or the first general method would then be uh, the dynamic light scattering meth method, which might be published in uh, Farm Europa, hopefully end of uh, next year, for commenting. The US would do the same, USP would do the same, uh, the Japanese pharmacopoeia also, and then we continue the collaboration to have a harmonized method in Jap Japan, US, and Europe, hopefully. Thank you, Julia. Um, Luigi Calzolai from the Joint Research Center, European Commission. So maybe something that is re not directly re related to nanomedicine, but uh, broader, we have a memorandum understanding directly with NIST, and one of our unit, former Institute for Reference Material and Methods in GEL, and they held very constant communication just to try to sort of harmonize and cooperate who's developing which material, what next, and what's going on. Then I think, I think it's a good example of an existing collaboration in the field. And then now we are going also to, towards more nanomedicine. Actually, just to give you a spotlight what's happening on top of this metrological level, you know, you have the, the place where the kilogram is still stored in Paris, and there is a working group in terms of metrology for biological science. That's the one which is exploding. Biological science goes under the mole, and that's part of that one. And they meet each year for one week in Paris, and then they look at certain needs and they do very basic comparison methods on that level. You know, for example, look at uh, PCR, how well that one is working. So that's where, the, where these institutions, all the official metrology labs, start harmonizing and finding references. I'll now open the floor for general discussion. Uh, again, thank you. Bryant and uh, um, so we have a few minutes and uh, Lisa because you haven't heard enough from me yet I just wanted to comment on something Patrick said at the beginning just to maybe clean the slate so if, with respect to this core and the existing cores I, I would see the, the nanomedicine core becoming an umbrella just like the EHS communities of researches and then whatever topics under that that, that you decide to, and, and we'll, you know, we'll set up a new web page. It, it won't, I mean, obviously there's, you know, areas of, of synergy that, that will facilitate, but um, I just wanted to. Thank you, thank you so much, <laughs> Thank you, any other, any comments, Patrick? Oh. Yeah, so, um, Mike, Mike. Mike. Yeah. Um, for, for the standardization, uh, there is a uh, program called IMPIR, and it's uh, also funded partially by the EU. I'm not too familiar with all the uh, standardization efforts, but it's a collaboration between many national research or uh, standardization organizations. And standardization for health is also one of the topics. So maybe that use can somehow be made of this. 
but that would have to be uh, investigated because I don't know. Impier, okay. impier, yeah. It's uh, you can access it when you go to the participant portal of Horizon 2020, because there are some programs that are kind of stand apart from Horizon 2020, but that are also funded by the EU, and impier is one of them. And the budget is big, it's about 1 billion euro for the framework program. Thank you. And, and part of it is funded by the member states, and other part is funded by the EU. Thank you. Any other comments? So I, I was really thinking about, um, you know, one of the topics, and again, it is as we mentioned, it depends on the community's interest. And um, I attended both the nanomedicine conferences. By the way, US FDA does not use nanomedicine terminology. We call them drug products containing nanomaterial. Um, <laughs> so nanomedicine is a short term that's. So the, the nano you know, medicine meetings, you know, we always talk about how great the products are. If you go to the Society of Toxicology meetings, all these are toxic. So for regulators, most often it becomes confusing in some ways. We, we have to worry about the safety of these nanomaterial and efficacy. And then the, the most important and <coughs> first thing is also about the material attributes. Can, can you make it consistently? And so th there are areas where these collaborations can come, the, the safety aspects. It's a nano safety, but then it's a societies of toxicology. And, and most nano medical product developers or scientists, they never go to SRT. And those SRT people, toxicologists, never come to the nano medicine meetings. So there is, there is always this, this dilemma um, for regulators because when you look at the publications, titanium oxide, cerium oxide, they're really toxic. And someone comes with a submission which data, but we, we do ask for data, and then, of course, it depends on the product. So, you know, that's one area in a, in a bigger overarching area. Standards certainly uh, is something that we have been working on, but we can continue to work on. Uh, but beyond that, uh, what other topics you think are interest? And then there are mechanisms that were proposed through Web, WebEx and then other face-to-face uh, -face meetings, meetings at meetings such as CleanArm conferences, such as CleanArm and other locations that we can meet. Anything else, Patrick, that you want to, to capture? Uh, I think, as you pointed out, you know, this is uh, first a new newborn community. So it, it, it's your community. It, it depends on you, on what you want to, how to use this framework. This framework works. You know, we have two examples, the, 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 the refine uh, uh, collaboration, I mean, uh, refine and US on standards and EU and CL. But we could add probably many more items in this list. And uh, so then it's up to you. And of course, we will continue this process. And on the new ATPN website, we will have a space dedicated to this Europe-US collaboration, calling for uh, suggestions. But uh, I don't know, maybe today, there may be already some ideas or some suggestions. Uh, yes, Ruth, please. I think another area is that um, we have um, recognized, uh, at least in Europe, that at the moment we don't have enough data. So um, combining the results and data in both, uh, uh, both the US and EU and have much more material for uh, education, outreach, lessons learned, that could be another area. Yeah, very relevant, yes, very good idea. A small, small comment to uh, what you were saying about the Society of Toxicology. Uh, there might be uh, room for a little bit more optimism. I know, for example, that there is a specialty section for medical devices at the SOT. So medical products are already represented. And I'm, I'm not so familiar with the SOT, but I, I would guess that my, maybe there's also a specialty section on drugs. And a, an idea could be to develop a specialty section on nano medicines. What do you think? So yeah, the Society of Toxicology, which is the largest toxicological society, at least we, I see global attendance when I go to those meetings, has a, a nanotechnology uh, section within SOT. But it is mostly, and this is where Patrick mentioned early on, you know, nanomedicine coming under EHS, right? So if you go to the, the 
see, there is inhalation toxicology, mm. right? But then inhalation can be used for therapeutic purposes, and we have a lot of examples of that. We don't usually enough to talk about such things. So there is inhalation toxicology, a huge working group, you know, huge uh, presentations, but then there are beneficial effects if you use the size, metering the size for that. So, but what I'm saying is that, that uh, bringing those communities together, having a greater understanding. If you look at any presentations from Gunther Oberdoster, if you, if you know him, he's a mm -hmm. person who, nanotoxicology guru, <laughs> he would show titanium oxide. Okay, this study did titanium oxide toxicology, and then he would show a big jar containing TiO2. So that's exposure. So when are you going to expo get exposed to this much titanium oxide? Almost never. And so, um, so the, the, if there is no toxicity, that's a good thing for nanomedicine, but it is less interesting for toxicologists because <laughs> it is safer. So, but then bringing those <laughs> communities together in a way that for regulators and scientists um, to understand that you know, these products that are coming through uh, can be approved. Because not, not everyone, you know, we are only three people from FDA at this meeting, right? And then you see only a handful of people at, you know, from FDA at these meetings. But then we have thousands of reviewers. And so we try to train them, but they have to rely upon existing knowledge, body of knowledge in the literature, apart from the submissions to understand. So it's, it's always confusing when, when we, you know, do this. And so that, I thought that is one area of course, standards are close to my heart. Education, knowledge sharing efforts, you know, the, the, that, that uh, was proposed is a good area. Patrick? Uh, just to add um, another suggestion, which has been uh, uh, discussed in Birmingham last September about uh, manufacture, GMP manufacturing of, of nanomedicines. Uh, well, uh, further to our meeting in September, I have contacted uh, the two private, I mean, two of, of the European um, uh, plants uh, or companies developing, uh, offering GMP manufacturing. So it is an ongoing uh, area where we have to, to identify the relevant partners and to see what are the issues for, for discussion. This just to, 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 to inform you that this is also another topic which is under preparation, I would say. Then at a certain stage, we have to decide whether it's worth initiating uh, another area of, of interaction or if it's useless, uh, as we discussed previously. So uh, any... Um thoughts on the emerging technologies containing nanomaterial, because that's something that we discuss with the other regulators. Um, so from our perspective, at least at FDA, we see, so nano is only an enabling mm -hmm. technology. But then they can be in 3D printing. They can be in other things where the merging of different kinds of technologies coming through. Any comments on that, whether this group may be interested in? That's something to think about. Mm. Mm. Okay, uh, uh, is it good? So we, we ran out of time 10 minutes ago. Um, but again, thank you very much for excellent presentation from all the speakers. Yeah. Appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, we will celebrate the Nano Day on October 9th. And Lisa, you have any final word? I just wanted to ask you, I mean, what do you, I mean for next steps for people who want to get engaged, I mean, we yeah, next step. Set up what, I mean, how do you want to, how do you want to gather Patrick. interest? Yeah. So, uh, the, the first, this EU-US cooperation has been uh, presented already in, uh, to the ATPN General Assembly last uh, May in, in Berlin. And uh, as I mentioned on the, on the new, because we are currently um, updating our website, on the new website there will be a space where people can in, uh, interact and make suggestions, like a forum, I would say. And this is one way, let's say, to, to, to collect suggestions. And uh, it has been decided that, let's say, every year at the ETP and General Assembly, we will uh, uh, initiate this discussion. And uh, so ETPN will uh, operate as, let's say, the European contact point for this uh, nanomed core. Good. Um, but, but we want to make sure that we keep the conversation going so that we actually you know, begin 
to develop um, a community mm -hmm. so, and, and facilitate your collaboration. And, and then maybe we can talk about doing a webinar in the next yep. short Definitely. time frame um, on some of the topics that we just talked about. Mm -hmm.